no place to escape to. This is the last time. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. What was that? So, okay. What if I did get my own show on InfoWars? Uh -huh. And I mean, I, honestly. Like Kissel does on Fox News, uh -huh. I'd be the moderate one. I'd be the cool one. The hip, liberal. <laughs> Hold on a second. How confused are you about yourself? I don't In know. In what world do you think you would be the moderate one, even on InfoWars? On InfoWars, I would be Trevor Noah. <laughs> on in on InfoWars, you would make Alex Jones seem like the moderate one and therefore would help him. That's right. You pull all attention to me. I take the heat. I hit on a grenade. I'm the Bruno Mars. <laughs> on InfoWars. Well, you know what? If you will it, it will be. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Technically, it's happened enough. It is. Welcome to the last podcast on the left, everyone. I am Ben Kissel. That's Marcus Parks. We got H-Bone in Los Angeles. Oh, my God. Today uh -oh. is the day to be reckoned with. I got my official acceptance letter from MUFON. Oh, my God. I am a VIP investigator. Wow. And today we're talking about one of the most controversial <laughs> and well-documented abduction stories of all time. Fire in the sky. Yeah. The Travis Walton story. That's it. The Travis Walton story. Fire in the sky. I can't believe you're I officially a nerd. You actually got <laughs> it put into yep. print. He paid to be a nerd. Wow. <laughs> All right. My polo has yet to arrive. It is because they are moving offices. Uh -huh. Quote, unquote, moving offices. It, they still have a very official looking email background. When my polo comes and my cap comes and my lanyard comes, then I can just walk it. I also get a coffee mug because you need the caffeine to stay up all night investigating. Uh huh. Once I get that lanyard, I think I can walk onto crime scenes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, yeah. So basically, you're going to be a nerdier Ken Bone, uh, <laughs> and you're going to dress like the dude who interrupted the baseball play for the Cubs <laughs> in the early 2000s. I'm going to be a sexier Ken Bone. <laughs> I'm taking the Ken Bone aesthetic, and I'm going to sex it up. I'm going to walk the walk. I'm going to talk the talk. Uh -huh. And when I get out there, and shit like what goes down, the infighting between the G. GSW, NICAP, and oh my APRO God. that we're going to be covering today, that kind of shit is going to end on my watch. <laughs> all right. I can't wait to see Detective Zabrowski out there <laughs> finding all the UFOs. Well, the Travis Walton abduction occurred on November 5th, 1975, outside the small Mormon mountain town of Snowflake, Arizona. It was witnessed by no less than seven people, including Travis Walton, the abductee in question. Can you imagine how hot it is? To be a Mormon in Arizona. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have to wear a full button-down shirt and a tie and slacks. It's 110, but it's a dry eat. These are the mountains. It's actually chilly up there. Once you get up oh. to northern Arizona, yeah, actually at nights there, it gets below freezing. It's true. Travis Walton makes a several, several desperate attempts to be like, you guys don't seem to understand <laughs> that Arizona's not just deserts and Indians attacking us left and right. <laughs> there are trees. Like, he's so defensive of the trees. But you could just see one Mormon turning to the other. And just being like, man, oh man, brother Jim, it certainly is hot out here. It's like, yep, yep, it does strengthen a Mormon brother, brother Thomas. It does strengthen to have the sweat roll down your khakis, down your legs. It's like, yes, yes, it, but, but thanks be to Jesus that we have this mission. Yes, yes, brother Thomas, yes. Do you know that if uh, I put my penis in your butt, we're still both virgins? <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, you got to a dick joke, and I'm so proud of you for that, Henry. <laughs> Well, although from Travis's perspective, he had only been gone a couple of hours, when he reappeared following the abduction, he found that he had been missing for five days. Ooh. By the time Travis was back in his own home, he found that his story had gone worldwide before he ever said a word about it himself. This abduction has been maligned again and again. It's been attacked. It's been extensively attempted to be debunked, especially by one piece of shit named Philip Class that we're going to get into. Ooh. And, and, uh -oh. very, and many different alien groups, you know, like MUFON does stand by Travis Walton. Uh, it is a very controversial case. So I beg you to hear us out. Okay? Hear us out. Well, I'm excited to hear why it's a controversial case, because, I mean, this is cut and dry. <laughs> of course the aliens abducted this sweaty, sweaty uh, well, individual in Arizona. I'm already mad. I'm already mad at No, what Kissel. did I do? I'm already Here mad. Here is Kissel already going against the common man, saying the, he's not, not good to, enough for a UFO abduction. I, he's not the... Henry's not the common man. He's got a card that says he's no longer one of us. <laughs> I'm a VIP investigator. <laughs>
<laughs> no, you may have already heard the tale of Travis Walton before this episode. In 1993, Walton's story was adapted for the movie Fire in the Sky, starring the guy who played the Liquid Terminator and the dude yes. who created Friday Night Lights. All the best. I just watched Terminator 2 again. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it holds up. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, it's super fun. And there's nothing that makes you feel more old than watching Edward Furlong and then Googling him <laughs> and seeing what time has yes. done to that poor, poor man. Yes. It's a really good warning for how not to live your life. How not to squander the green light given to you by Hollywood. <laughs> I just don't know what happened to him. Actually, and you know, Fire in the Sky, it's really fun. I would recommend going and watch it. It's, it's uh, I think, on like Amazon Prime. Uh, but while the movie does stick to the true events in many ways, the real story is, as it always is with aliens, much more complicated, much weirder, mm. and much dumber than the movies portray. <laughs> so without further ado, here is the true story. Of Travis Walton. Yeah, you fucking idiots. We We're getting into this shit. <laughs> okay. So excited. Here we go. On November 5th, 1975, Travis Walton, his best friend Mike Rogers, and five other loggers, Ken Peterson, John Goulet, Stephen Pierce, Alan Dallas, and Dwayne Smith, were on a job near Turkey Springs, Arizona. Now, this is important to remember. This is a logger story. Oh. Okay? This is not... Uh, there's, and there's different, right? Because, like, with drifters that we've covered before, drifters are chaotic evil in the D&D &D alignment world, right? We'll do anything for a buck. But loggers are chaotic good. <laughs> yeah. And they will do things the right way. And here is a description that Travis Walton write himself of the, of the very nature of the soul of the logger. So you can understand where these people come from, who these people are. Yeah. And why you got to take their word for it, whatever the fuck it is that they say. Because they've seen some shit. I guarantee you. Yeah, loggers are a trustworthy people. You can't lie. Trees know it. You can't. <laughs> So this is from the Walton Experience by Travis Walton. The Walton Experience does sound like a prog rock band, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> For a man out there on the mountain, his battle, in a way, really isn't with the baking sun, chilling winds, steep terrain, thorn bushes, or dangerous equipment. His battle isn't with the rough roads, mud holes, biting insects, or gnarly thickets. The real struggle is with the inner self. Call it fiber, backbone, or grit. True toughness is internal. The ability to keep going when he's hot, thirsty, at breath, when his hands hurt and his muscles ache, while bark, bugs, pine needles, and sawdust are falling down his shirt to stick in his sweat. The ability to say yes to more of this and no to the beckoning shade tree. Because he knows he ought to. Because that's what he said he'd do. This can help give a man the power to say yes or no in the right instances to just about anything. And to act consistently with what he says. And to confront daily the inflexible realities of a quote-unquote real world that has teeth and bites back with immediate logical consequences regardless of sophistical argument or politically correct rationalization can teach someone else in short supply common sense. Common sense. I feel like that's what he wrote for his Tinder profile <laughs> and then realized that he only has a limited amount of characters and then just went back to, I'm a logger. <laughs> I'm a logger. <laughs> I'm a logger. That is kind of erotica as well. Uh, you, can, you get the visual of the man sweating yeah. and sort of like, you know, all the uh, all the wood chips going in his hairy chest like bizarre Plinko chips. Yeah, they're super sexy. And Travis Walton and Mike Rogers were way into karate. Huh. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Now here's what Logan had to do with the UFO abduction. See, Mike had a contract with the Forest Service to clear out some brush. But as he had taken on two other jobs at the same time, he was behind schedule. Mm. So the crew was working dawn till dusk to try to fulfill the contract in time. It's hard to be a logger. You are always on call. If a tree needs to be felled, call a logger. If a tree needs to be rolled down a hill, call a logger. Brush needs to be slimmed. Call a logger. Does your daughter need her virginity cracked wide open? <laughs> Call a logger. Beavers are the loggers of the animal world. And isn't that fun? Well, I think that beavers actually got... Vaginas got the nickname beavers from loggers fucking them all the time while lonely on the mountain. I'm not sure if that's the case. I am. You are? Oh, yeah. 100% sure about 98. that? 98. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how that term came to be. Wood chipping, I think it's some sort of analogy there. So at around 6 p.m., the seven men were on their way back to Snowflake when they saw a strange, fire-like, yellowish light just above the tree line. But they smelled no smoke, and they heard nothing. Their first theory is that they thought it was night hunting for deer, 
which sounds incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, usually, I mean, it's spotlight hunting, and you usually do it from a moving truck. Oh, it's pretty fun. We, we yeah, we used to go spotlighting or shining, as it was called, mm-hmm. but we never shot any of the deer. We just look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as the men got closer, they saw that the light was emanating from a golden UFO hanging in the air. Your classic two-pie flying saucer. Two-pie. That's a two-pie? Uh-huh. Two-pie tins on top of each other. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Mike Rogers stopped the truck and turned off the key, and the seven men stared as the craft didn't move an inch, projecting a soft blue light directly below. Uh, By Travis Walton's reckoning, the saucer was 15 to 20 feet wide and 8 to 10 feet thick. Mm. And then... For reasons that will become clear later, Travis decided he absolutely had to have a closer look. The only one with the grit. Henry, you know a lot about the, the toughness. Yeah, you know about the aliens. What is it about the sort of the working class uh, people that the aliens are drawn to? Their eyes have been opened by their treatment by the government, by the treatment of smug, quote unquote, liberal, or what he puts in here, metropolitan society. <laughs> how they view the logger. I see. Okay. Yeah, the working man has a third eye open just a little bit wider than your, say, Wall Street type. We're not going to get into their diet here. (laughs) (laughs) Kiss all. (laughs) (laughs) Travis opened the passenger side door and walked toward the saucer, much to the protest of the other six men who were now yelling at Mike to get the fuck back in the truck so they could get the hell out of there. But the truth is that Travis Walton, he says that I've now watched several speeches of his, and each one he says, he's been like, I was out there, yes, I'm an impetuous sort. I've been known to jump jump onto a jet ski or or even take a trapeze lesson if it was the circus ever came to town, which never did. <laughs> but I did do I was out there I was obviously yucking it up for my crew members. He says he was doing it as a lark, because he always would do that, because he collected old cars. Oh, that is kind of fun. <laughs> as Travis drew closer to the UFO's beam, he said he could hear a mix of low and high-pitched sounds. Beep, beep, superimposed over the sound of heavy, heavy machinery that was somehow softened. Wait, what does that sound like? Beep, beep. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. So it's so a semi truck was backing up while listening to like Pink Floyd. Is that what that was? Did they just get abducted by a trucker? It's possible. <laughs> they just all got abducted by David Parker Ray. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, yeah. Oh god, I hate the toy box killer. Oh, it never... really does bring a new meaning to the term logger. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And when Travis was directly underneath the UFO's beam, the sound got louder as if huge turbines were spooling up. The craft then moved for the first time, wobbling from side to side. And at this point, Travis realized he was screwing around with something he probably shouldn't have been and figured it was a good idea to back up a bit. But before he could get out from under the glow, the light suddenly changed from blue to a blue-green. And then what he said is that his first instinct was that he saw a log next to like that was sticking up we're right underneath the ufo and he jumped behind it because that's a logger's first line of defense use the trees yeah Interesting. second line of offense you piss on your enemy yeah that's a very big thing is that if you really want to make sure you're safe in, a, in any sort of close sort of hand hand combat you take off your pants and you just start pissing wow vip move on <laughs> vip advice it's that kind of advice that he got with that card an unbelievable <laughs> amount of knowledge that you've learned, uh, that you've earned over these hard years of research. You're welcome. But you would think it's I- it's ironic that he used the tree uh, to protect him because these are the they're, they're massacres. They're the goibles of the tree world. These people are murdering ben, trees. Ben, his log does not judge. No. And guess what? That log didn't judge him? No. That judge knows because trees know that time is a circle, <laughs> right? Like in the true detective. Yes. <laughs> Flat circles. And then also, uh, they were not just felling trees. They were thinning the brush. What they were doing is they take all the dead saplings that nature would normally take hundreds of years of and speeding up the process of cleaning out all the dead and diseased trees to give more room for uh, feeding of bears, oh, for sexing of bears. I see. Um, for, for, to put in new animals in there, toucans, oh. rabbits, <laughs> that, uh, you know, stuff like that. I love toucans. <laughs> Well, just after the light changed from blue to blue-green, Travis was lifted into the air and knocked back ten feet as if a great force had been exerted upon him, and he landed hard on his right shoulder. Mm. Somewhat 
understandably, Mike Rogers started the truck back up and got the hell out of there, smashing through tree branches and boulders, almost destroying his truck trying to get away from this goddamn thing. <laughs> so it's it's fun to know that your friends will not help you. <laughs> yes. This was just definitive proof that his friends were just like, when push comes to shove, it's like, we're just going to go. Let's get the fuck out of here. Well, they said immediately they thought that it, it murdered him. And also, the, the drive up there was very, very treacherous. And they have, they said they was filled with lumps in the road that they called thank you, ma'ams. Because when they hit the bottom of the truck, it would go wham, bam. Uh, they're so fucking clever, these fucking loggers. <laughs> that's fun. That's trucker humor mixed with construction work humor. That's logger, logger humor. That's what a logger is. A logger is a trucker mixed with a construction worker. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're like drifters with skills. Cool. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like loggers. <laughs> Now, the men finally stopped a few miles down the road and argued amongst themselves as to whether or not they should go back. Now, it was eventually agreed that some of the men would build a campfire and stay behind while a few of the others would go back to see if Travis was dead, alive, or missing altogether. Hmm. But just as Mike Rogers was about to get back into the truck, he saw off in the distance the UFO rise up above the trees and fly away, as these things do, at an impossible speed. Marcus, you say impossible, I say improbable. <laughs> That's it. VIP expert. VIP investigator yeah. Henry Zabrowski, <laughs> open to challenges. Uh -huh. Everything is a challenge. Everything is a puzzle to be solved. How much did you pay for your, uh, for your official nerd card two hundred dollars <laughs> and the card has yet to arrive the card is yet to arrive either so I don't have any of my swag yet but I did get an email saying confirming that they got my money <laughs> so that is good Today's last podcast on the left is brought to you by Casper Mattresses. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Supportive memory foams create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they will pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. They got free shipping and returns to the United States and Canada, so no worries there. With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. I got a Casper mattress. Henry's got a Casper mattress. Ben has a Casper mattress, and we all absolutely love the damn things. Right now, you can get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash L-E-F-T and using the offer code L-E-F-T. That's www.casper.com slash L-E-F-T. Offer code L-E-F-T. Terms and conditions apply. <laughs> Now that the craft was gone, all of them agreed to go back together. But when they arrived back at the site, they found no trace of Travis Walton. They drove back to civilization and called the police at about 7.30, an hour and a half after the alleged incident. You also remember, these are also like the progeny of Mormons, a lot of these guys. So it's something like, man, what a tough day logging. <sighs> Better have some cool iced tea. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, no, no, brother Jim. No, no, no. Absolutely not. That has caffeine in it. God damn it. I guess we could do that non-virginating sex thing again. Yes, that does relieve the tension, doesn't it, brother Jim? <laughs> well, being Mormon actually gives them a lot more credibility, though. Yeah. Well, they're definitely sober. They're honest people. The Mormons don't lie. Well, not all of them were Mormon. We'll see later on. Uh, some of them? Sober. Some of them were Mormon. They're Mormon stock. I see. Yeah. Now, did they call the sheriff department, and was it the sheriff's last day? Did he say he was too old for this <laughs> shit? Is it possible that that happened? Because I would like to see that storyline as well. Like, God damn it. Hey, you're one day from retirement. No. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison met the boys in a shopping center parking lot and found all of them visibly upset, with a couple of them even having tears in their eyes. And Ellison said about their behavior that they were acting. They were awfully good at it. And I know for a fact that they are not, because I saw their falsies and rendition of Pippin. It was uninspired. <laughs> oh, Pippin. Well, Ellison called up his superior officer, who gathered up a small crew to search the site, but they found nothing. Police then informed Travis's mother, a stoic mountain woman, who acted calm when she heard the news. A little Ooh. too calm, according to some. Really? Mm-hmm. 
did, did the mother take Travis? No, she's just warm and she doesn't feel anything. They're all just like, oh, <laughs> like I'm not sure that maybe is a, that may be a generalization. Oh, they I, feel, but they feel. Uh, what it comes down to, sometimes what helps an investigation is broad generalizations because <laughs> that's what helps. Yeah. I'm a MUFON, a MUFON member. Make things easier for yourself. That's the first thing that. That's one of the first rules I got in the handbook. <laughs> that's it. Is that make it easier? But but it's true, right? But you have these five guys, they're these six guys. They're you're kind of used to being like local yucksters, um, but they show up and they're very very upset. So at first, of course, they're 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 freaking out because Ellison's watching these guys come and say we saw a UFO, and he's trying to sort of like let the line out because we're going to find out he's slowly but try he's trying to build a case. And actually, now that I think about it, I remember we did a great show in Salt Lake City, had a yeah. wonderful time, and uh, Mormons are drunk as hell. Well, uh, so I completely take back what I said regarding their sobriety because we were there over, it was like, uh, it was the Final Four weekend for NCAA basketball. Uh-huh. It was St. Patrick's Day. Yep. And then there was also Comic-Con. Yeah, yeah. They, it was the drunkest place I have been <laughs> in a long time. And they were very emotional, but yes. like unstable emotional. I didn't mess with them. <laughs> they were messing with me, though. They were a big guy. Big guy. Big guy. Now, of course, the news of the abduction spread like wildfire. Within two days, the Travis Walton story had been picked up worldwide, and UFO investigators descended upon Snowflake, Arizona, in the dozens. Because when they showed back, well, because we didn't even say that, right? Because they did go back to the site, and he wasn't there. And then they went back with Ellison to go look at him again. They went to go look, and he wasn't there. So they had no clue where he went. Right. Uh, they know the UFO left, and so they're just sitting there. But, of course, now it makes them look very guilty as a group of six loggers. All right, so, but we're in the early 90s here, right? No, it's 1975. 1975. The, the so movie we don't was ha- in the early 90s. We don't have the internet. We don't have anything. We barely have... We're, we're still in the Pony Express days. How what did it get... I don't, know, to- I don't know about time very well. <laughs> but how did it get so far? How did the story spread so quickly? Well, it's one of those things where it, it goes on the local news and it gets picked up by the AP wire. Mm. It goes on the AP wire and then they start picking it up in Australia. They start picking it up in Japan. I mean, everybody... Uh, it, People around the world knew about this story. Did Dan Rather cover it? I don't think Dan Rather covered it, no. Okay. I tell you what, Dan Rather would not. But I, uh, the, the, you see, there are so many. That's a good joke. Bang! Pow! That is a good joke. But, um, <laughs> Wham, bam! <laughs> Wham, bam! That's a longer joke right there. But uh, it's, the truth is that you also do, <laughs> you have no respect for the true tenacity of UFO groups. And what they will do when they hear a hot fucking case ready to show up. Because they're basically coming up. Like, we're all on the fucking lookout mm-hmm. for the real mm-hmm. juice. And this is a good story. Sure. You know, you, you've got a lot of witnesses. Uh, there's yep. just there's a lot there's a lot of meat here to chew on. And totally. you got six people. You got six people to interview. You know, six it's, witnesses. Yeah, six witnesses. So okay. there's a lot going. There's yeah. a lot that the news media can sink their teeth into, sure. and a lot that a lot of people that UFO investigators can talk to. Usually, it's one shell shocked person that they have to try to get an answer out of. Right but now, they've got six tough logger dudes. Uh, and yeah. actually, they said that these guys were well. At least some of the other UFO investigators that came from Australia, a couple, a couple of them wrote that they're like they were the meanest, rough and tumble cowboys you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can believe but it. Think about this. Too. Right, because there were plenty of believers, but there were also a bunch of skeptics, like the local police. Because immediately they're treating this whole thing like a, mi- a missing persons case, as they should have. Which yeah, Marcus right. notes here, they definitely should have. But a part of that is true, right? So now you have that's even juicier. You've got a UFO story that could be masking a murder case, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So there is just one lucky buffet in Snowflake, Arizona, <laughs> that is just about to close up their doors until they see uh, dozens of nerds coming through and they're like, honey, put the pork roast back in the oven. We're staying in business for another month. Honey, honey, hide the dice from our favorite board games. They're going to be role play. <laughs> so this whole town is just overrun now with UFO people yeah. out of nowhere. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the local police's working theory was that one or all of the six men had murdered Travis Walton oh. either on purpose or by accident and it concocted the UFO story to explain away the disappearance. Hmm. When Travis hadn't showed back up by Monday, all six of the loggers were subjected to a polygraph test. 
the first of dozens to be had over the course of this story. Hmm. That is a thing that I will break with the UFO community on. I do not think that polygraph tests are the be-all, end-all of like, that's a truth. Now it's a lie. <laughs> yes. It's all just the dumb. They just love these things because they just think it's just like, but it's called a lie detector test. No, they, they go even further. See, it detects lies. They go even further than they're like, uh, actually, it's not a lie detector. Lie detector is the popular nomenclature. The preferred nomenclature is polygraph test. It does not actually... <laughs> detect lies it detects reactions to questions which can then be interpreted as truth or falsehood shut up terry <laughs> my goodness yes the polygraph test is we haven't really gotten that much more evolved than when we were uh, hanging witches in salem that's basically the polygraph no. test is totally useless basically well the loggers were asked among other things if they had caused serious physical injury to travis uh -oh. If his body was buried or hidden somewhere around Turkey Springs, and if they had actually seen a UFO. They answered no to the first two questions mm -hmm. and yes to the third. Five out of the six men passed the test, with the sixth coming out inconclusive because the guy, Alan Dallas, was a shifty drifter who just didn't like being asked questions. Don't ask him questions. Here's the thing. Drifters can't be trusted. Loggers <laughs> are like the bookhouse boys from mm -hmm. Twin Peaks. They are a brotherhood of good men that do good deeds under the shadow of night. Drifter amongst a logger is like a dwarf amongst an elf. <laughs> They're different races. They need different space. I see. Okay. Also, Alan Dallas, and they say several times within the, the, the Fire of the Sky book, is that he had a, a, a beard. He had a naughty beard Ooh. that the rest of them couldn't trade. He was shady. Alan Dallas, he was the only one with the full beard. Uh. And they were like, couldn't trust him because you can't see his chin. Yeah, all the rest of them either had nice, thick, full man mustaches mm -hmm. or wispy, thin teen mustaches. Make a calendar out of these guys. <laughs> wow. That is hot stuff. Now, the believers actually outweighed the skeptics in Snowflake, with Travis's brother and mother being the ones most ready to believe the story. Hmm. See, the Walton family were not necessarily UFO experts in the sense that, say, a Henry is an expert. Thank you, VIP investigator Henry Saprowski. <laughs> if you would it. please call me that from now on, that is my new title. That is officially my title. It will be on my letterhead. But... The mother and the brother definitely discussed the possibility of life on other planets visiting Earth on many a late night. Hmm. Okay. So they're open to the idea. Yeah, they're open to the idea. And in an interview with ufologist Fred Sylvanus. I hate you. I like ufologists. <laughs> I, I like it called ufos better. <laughs> ufos. Yeah. Ufo. <laughs> it sounds like a fun Ugh. shoe that squeaks. <laughs> Make me fucking mad. Makes me crazy. Makes me fucking... <laughs> I'm like an Oregonian over here. Oh, my goodness. Names. Oregon. <laughs> well, in an interview with ufologist Fred Sylvanus, Travis's brother Dwayne calmly said that the UFOs were friendly and that he had, quote, a feeling, a strong feeling. Uh -oh that Travis would be returned safely. Now, Dwayne is really the center of all of the UFO organization's activities in this story. Dwayne obviously contacted some people as soon as he heard the story. Dwayne has been waiting for this moment. Dwayne is me. <laughs> Dwayne is a dude that is, he has been into UFOs for a long time. He claims to have seen one. It's pretty sweet. Well, maybe he's too into it, though, huh? It seems like he's, uh, Shut he's up. ready to go here. <laughs> no. He might be. No, he did the fucking work, Kissel. What if he they did all the proper did... work. He did the reading. And he was the only one. What if they all no, I was immediately started okay. yelling. He was the only one that had the guts and the know how, the know how. I don't to save his brother. But he didn't save him because they just went away immediately. Well, just because somebody has prior knowledge of a subject does not automatically make their claims that they experienced said subject complete and total falsehood. That's a coincidence. It's a coincidence, of oh, course. Okay. Say it's it, a coincidence. Say Henry saw a UFO. Would you automatically say he was lying? Henry, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will Go always fuck say. I would never lie yeah, about that. I no, need to you, see. This is the difference. I need I'm to see so much home. documentation if you ever see a. UFO. I am standing. I'm standing so up in my own home to tell you this is that I would say that I will never fucking lie about seeing a UFO because uh -huh. because of my knowledge of the fact, and I will not add to the the ammo of the critiques about my fucking beloved science, <laughs> mm -hmm. ufology, <laughs> aka sipping whiskey while getting stoned, staring at the sky from your roof. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you put it like that, I'm kinda, I kind of like it, too. Yeah. Now, Dwayne was so confident that Travis wasn't in any danger 
Dwayne said the only thing that bothered him was that he wasn't along for the ride. Fuck yeah! <laughs> See, the brothers had had many a conversation over the years about what they would do if they ever saw a UFO. Both agreed that the best tactic would be to, quote, immediately get as directly underneath the object as physically possible what? to maximize their chance of abduct abduction. Oh, they wanted to get abducted. Yeah! Exactly right. They wanted to. They wanted to. Of course he did. It's the ultimate fucking adventure, you idiot. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Exactly God. What it is. These you guys. get to zip zop around the fucking skies of different dimensions. You're hanging out with the flight of the navigator, dude. Okay. It turned out to be a child molester, but that's not his fault. Technically, that's well, not the character's fault. It's never a good. Why would they want to be abducted? No abduction story is very good. They're out there like Woody Harrelson in White Men Can't Jump trying to entice their way into the game. We saw what happened in that movie. A lot of controversy. Well, there is a theory as to why the Walton brothers were so in. UFOs. Apparently, their father was a huge UFO fanatic, and he abandoned them at a young age and disappeared. They never saw him again. <laughs> well, it's very sad. <laughs> so the story is based in ultimate sadness and childhood loneliness. That is sad. Now That's I understand sad. a little it's, bit more. It's deep seated trauma. I was legitimately thinking, you gotta if you see an alien, you gotta squeeze yourself. You yeah. know what I'm talking uh, about? What? You gotta you gotta milk yourself. <laughs> you gotta get it all out. Yes, so then yes. the aliens say, "Oh, he's on empty. We don't want him." So you mean is if an alien's trying to abduct you, you immediately start masturbating? However you gotta do it. <laughs> I would do the That's same what exact they want, thing. Right? That's, I would do the same exact thing, but I'm actually already pretty emptied. Uh-huh. <laughs> Always so go I out empty. I think that I would be a good candidate. Henry, when you go on your missions as Lieutenant Detective Henry Zabrowski VIP MUFON, always go out empty. Yeah. And as soon as you start to feel yourself getting full, Clock out of work. Because <laughs> you have, do you have that thing that your balls tingle like forty five minutes after you jerk off? Yeah. No. Hell yeah. Yeah, because right. that's just filling it back. That's it filling it back. That, I don't know if that's how it as works. As fast as it possibly can. Roll them up. Roll them up, boys. Get up. Come on, boys. Come on, boys. <laughs> well, to do a different. Like loggers felling trees under a deadline. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sorry I brought us here. This is all my fault, actually. <laughs> well, Dwayne and Travis. Both said that once aboard, whoever got abducted would convince the abductors to go pick up the other brother so they could both enjoy it together. But it seemed like to Dwayne that this was not the scenario that played out. Yeah, because you can't get abducted and be like, hey, aliens, we got two stops. <laughs> like, they're going to wherever they want to take you. No, it's like going to an after party with somebody else who's, like, in the show that you were going to see and, being, and having to introduce them and being like, this is my friend Henry. He's also an actor. <laughs> you know, like, which is, just never works out. Never heard of him. <laughs> oh, is that a VIP lanyard for MUFON? Yes. Welcome, Mr. Zabrowski. I am an investigator. Now, Fred Silvetis was not the only ufologist to contact the Walton family in those first few days. They were also contacted by a man named William Spaulding. He was the Western director of the Ground Saucer Watch, a.k.a. the GSW. Wait, hold on, what? Western director of the GSW. The Ground Sausage Watch? No, no, saucer. no Ground Saucer, saucer. Watch, Okay, I, I heard Ground Sausage Watch, and I'm like, what kind of Midwestern <laughs> polka fuck bizarre <laughs> family is this? We're the I Ground Saucer <laughs> Watch? Sausage Watch? But you have to remember... So the Condon Report came out in 1968. The Condon Report was the official government line that UFOs mean nothing, and they and made them close Project Blue Book and Project Gleam, right? So they, they closed everything down. They said, essentially, we don't give a shit about UFOs. They are not real. So when 1968 happened and all of the official avenues for UFO investigation were shut down, that's really where civilians took over. That's where people came in, like the GSW popped out, APRO, which is the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, popped out, NICAP came out. All of these different groups popped up run by very driven, broke nerds that just started hitting the streets saying, being like, if the government's not going to handle our shit, we as American citizens, proud sovereign nations, each unto our own, <laughs> are going to go out there and we are going to investigate UFOs for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're putting it in terms that I like, Henry. <laughs> yeah, there were some of them who operated in an unofficial capacity. Oh, I see. <laughs> no lanyard. No lanyard. <laughs> see, at least no I, lanyard. At least I have a lanyard. Not yet. <laughs> Well, Spaulding told Dwayne that he would provide a free medical examination of Travis upon Travis's return, emphasizing the importance of securing a sample of Travis's, quote, 
first voided specimen. Hold on a second. Who is this guy that's going to give him this thing? William Spaulding, Western Director of the Ground Saucer Watch. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming he is he's a lot wide. Bill Spaulding. Bill Spaulding. <laughs> so whatever happens to Travis when he's up there in the sky, we know what occurs. A lot of milkings, a lot of things like that. And then he comes back to Earth, and now this guy's going to fiddle with him? No, well, he's Leave not this gonna, guy alone! He's not going to fiddle with him, he just wants his first voided specimen. Kissel, you, come on. <sighs> Get Good in the fuck. Get with the program. All right. It's his first voided specimen. You have to remember this, all right? And you have to fucking promise me this, boys, is that when I am, if I'm ever abducted and I return, the first thing I do is going to come to you with a jar of piss, <laughs> and you must send it to Mufar. You have to send it because that is your duty as my friend, as Ugh, my fucking. Yeah. You are my emergency. Reach out. I'll tell you what, man. When it when it happens, we'll flip for it. We'll flip for it. That's <laughs> fine. We'll look for all the weird marks on Henry's body, and most of them, I'm sure, Henry. Will just be like, that was there before the abduction. No, that was there before the abduction as well. Be like, just what's wrong with you? And then we diagnose him with stage four cancer. <laughs> we actually save his life. Well, William Spaulding, Dwayne Walton, and everybody else would get their shot at that first voided specimen when Travis returned on November 10th. At 12.05 a.m., mm. Travis's sister got a collect phone call. Travis had called her from an Exxon station in Haber, Arizona, some 33 miles away. Mm. They called Dwayne, piled in a truck, and headed on over. There they found Travis Walton dehydrated, incoherent, and highly agitated, <laughs> slumped over inside a phone booth. Oh, man, it's like the world's saddest Terminator. It is. <laughs> But instead of letting the authorities know that the man who had been missing for five days under suspicion of murder had been found, Dwayne immediately called William Spaulding of the GSW to take him up on that free doctor offer. You oh, do okay. the same exact thing for me. I don't want any police involved until we've caught the alien ourselves. <laughs> right. So the crew drove 144 miles in the middle of the night. It's almost three hours from Haber, Arizona to Phoenix where they met with a Dr. Lester Stewart. Mm. But when they asked for his credentials, they discovered that he was not a doctor. <laughs> he was a hypnotherapist. Yes, can you imagine oh. them showing up and he's like, one, two, three, you're out. <laughs> now, when I snap, your ass is a vase. <laughs> One, two, three, you're back up. Oh, look, I found these beautiful flowers, Travis. <laughs> but this guy markets himself as a doctor. Oh, absolutely. Well, okay. the GSW told them that, like, we uh, have a doctor that will examine you. But I'm pretty sure what it was, the GSW was one of the poor fucks. They were one of the super poor organizations. Mm. And the only person they could find who might have had some sort of medical experience mm -hmm. was a hypnotherapist they knew named Lester. Okay. He was a um, he was a medic in the army. Oh, okay. That's what that's what he came out. He said he was a medic in the army and he got the name uh, he got the doctor title by just printing it on a piece of paper oh. and putting it up on his wall. Huh. Yeah. So All but right. he was not a doctor. Oh, okay. he was not a doctor. So 45 minutes later the Waltons had already headed on back to Snowflake. They weren't going to let the hypnotherapist uh, poke around Travis. Oh. But to the GSW's credit before Travis left, that first voided specimen was indeed sampled and analyzed. What is the specimen? Piss! Uh. <laughs> when the results came back, Travis tested negative for drugs and alcohol. However, uh -uh. according to the doctor, he did not himself witness Travis fill the jar. According to the doctor, Dwayne just handed him a jar of piss and said it was Travis's. Could have been anyone. Oh, go fuck oh. yourself. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Who I mean, knows? Others do keep jar of pisses, like, ready to go. Like, that is true. That's a part of... Because they have to cover themselves with their own piss to make themselves invisible to skunk. I'm actually not really sure. How nature works. I think you, I, uh, I'm pretty sure you have to cover yourself with the urine of the animal that you don't want to be eaten by, right? Well, I mean, if, if you want to hunt an animal, then uh -huh. you cover it, you cover it to mask your scent, to make it not human. Like, if you want to hunt deer, you cover yourself in deer pits. Yeah. But and that's what Jeffrey Dahmer did, but we know when he was hunting, <laughs> and I don't want to get into it. Was that what our president was doing in Russia? Hunting. Was he just hunting. trying to make himself invisible to hookers? <laughs> Sex workers, Henry, please. Yeah. For the for cried out loud. And I found out strippers are sex workers. I know. Huh. That's what I yes, said. We that found for. that out. And we are learning. We're learning. I'm sorry. Every every day I learn. My what goodness. You know? I always thought they were exotic dancers. Well what they are wonderful people. That, yes. That's what I call I just, everyone. Anybody who dances 
is so free. It is sad when they dance like no one's looking, though, because then they're ignoring you. <laughs> and that's, uh, <laughs> that's kind of sad. Yeah, yeah, that's all these of... exotic dancers, all these sex workers are dancing like no one's looking. What am I paying for? <laughs> anyway, if, if I did it. <laughs> if I did it. <laughs> so Travis returned to Snowflake Tuesday morning, and by Tuesday night, the Waltons had gotten a phone call from another UFO team. The Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, a.k.a. APRO. Ooh. Unlike the GSW, APRO had a powerful and well-known ally, the National Enquirer. Now, oh. back then, the National Enquirer was only half celebrity gossip. The other half was dedicated to UFOs, Bigfoots, and post-1977, Elvis side. and but they actually look for legit cases. They would look. They would try to make these things as airtight as possible. Because one of the weird things about the National Enquirer is that because it's always sensational news and and l l ridiculous bullshit in there, mm -hmm. they uh, they couch it with like real UFO stories, and that was sort of like the way that was like an avenue to get a UFO story out to the mass public. Yeah, and also they provided funds for research, which all of these civilian UFO groups desperately need. Yeah. And so when this dude showed up, when they showed up and basically said, like, we'll fund this whole research thing, they're like, okay. And so you just kind of sign a deal with the devil to know, like, well, at least we'll get all of this done, done quote unquote, legitimately as much as possible. And yeah. if you want to understand how messed up our current world is, the National Enquirer endorsed Donald Trump. He's very good friends with the head of the National Enquirer. Yeah. And they also stumble upon the truth on occasion. They broke the John Edwards scandal, for example, when yep. he had the affair. Yep. Uh, so they do, there is, like, snippets of truth in there yeah little very thing, weird little things here and there but yep they went from a ufo to a mouthpiece for the president isn't in, that in insane just a short few decades wow we yeah. are losing touch with reality on a regular basis <laughs> all around the world you just gotta believe in yourself that's I all it guess. shows me it actually gives me hope you just go out there and you make something out of yourself you can do mm -hmm. it if you make your own reality then no one else's reality matters isn't that lying is that called <laughs> no. lying or does that not exist anymore no. that doesn't no, exist no. anymore no. okay all right i'm sorry well, this whole APRO National Enquirer Alliance is where the first split in the UFO community concerning the Travis Walton abduction began. Mm. Any listener of last podcast knows that no academic discipline has more infighting than the UFO paranormal community. We have to unite the groups. <laughs> we have to true. unite yeah. the gangs. And when I become commandant of MUFON, which I think <laughs> is the name of the top position at MUFON, which I will become, I will unite the gangs. Yeah. So you're, you're going to be like the Cyrus of alien, of alien organizations? We will become one front. And then we, will we truly be a force to be reckoned with? When you say the gangs, you mean different sects of alien alienologists, uh, ufologists, you, ufologists, U ufologists. Yeah, sure. You racist. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're a racist. Well, really, that's not for lack of trying. People try bringing together these guys from time to time. Uh huh. For example, this is an excerpt from an article published in the Ground Saucer Watch newsletter concerning the discord in the UFO community. Okay. During October of last year, I was a participant in a national UFO conference at Fort Smith, Arkansas. The theme of the meeting was United for Objectivity. In all fairness to Bill Pitts, the organizer of this broad undertaking, it was a monumental achievement. Bringing together all the major civilian organizations, leaders in one building at one time. We left Fort Smith with mixed, but good feelings. <laughs> Unfortunately, no high-level resolutions were established, nor were any serious objectives planned for the future. On the plus side, I felt the petty ill feelings existing between the organizations was settled, and now some constructive teamwork could have been accomplished in the 70s. That's great. Meanwhile, there's one there's one guy dressed like Worf, just completely <laughs> confused on what the convention was all about, thinking it was more of a cosplay event. This is 1975. It's long before Worf. I know. He would be Spock. I, yeah. You are inaccurate. I you was, need to it doesn't matter. <laughs> it does it does matter. It does Ben, these are alien episodes. Alien episodes are required to be factually accurate if we are ever to be taken seriously. You cannot have an you cannot have an anachronism not, in this episode, Ben. But no, I am the glad entire because all critics, they're looking for their spot. They're looking for the hole in the armor. And you fucking pieces of shit, you, as soon as we get a chink in the well, armor, they come for us, man. And I'm ready for it. It's like the mafia. I just feel like the whole thing, I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> but, alas, three weeks after that meeting in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Travis Walton was abducted 
and the fragile peace collapsed. Mm. Today's last podcast on the left is brought to you by the new Paramount Pictures film, Mother. A couple's relationship is tested when uninvited guests arrive at their home, disrupting their tranquil existence. From filmmaker Darren Aronofsky, director of Black Swan and Requiem for a Dream, Mother stars Jennifer Lawrence, Javier Bardem, Ed Harris, and Michelle Pfeiffer in this riveting psychological thriller about love, devotion, and sacrifice. Mother is darkly intelligent, well acted, and rumored to be one of the most controversial films to come out of Hollywood in a long time. It's the kind of smart and scary psychological thriller director Darren Aronofsky is known for, and is sure to generate a lot of discussion after the credits have ended. Mother is out in theaters September 15th. Go see it, and don't miss the movie everyone will be talking about. That's Mother, out September 15th. Coming. To a theater near you. So after the incident with the hypnotherapist, Dwayne, who had at this point pretty much had taken over for Travis, decided to cut ties with the GSW and sided with APRO instead, who had admittedly thrown in with the National Enquirer for their vast financial resources, of which APRO had none. I will say, when groups use acronyms, it does sound much more intense. It yeah. seems like, you know, something's happening. No, in they know that. Nerds love it. Nerds love acronyms. It is fantastic. It's great because then it's it makes you sound like you work for the CIA. Yeah, and you get also get to kind of like make a little puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got to have an acronym that you can just say as a word. Right. So you get to re rearrange all the words of your organization to make it sound like MUFON. Yeah. Nightcap. Yeah. And one day I'm gonna have a polo that says MUFON on it, and when I have it, it's gonna look like I work like at a, I work at a much more important Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> And through the resources from the National Enquirer, APRO was able to hire their own hypnotherapist who was able to unlock Travis's memories to give us the full story of just what happened after his friends sped off into the darkness to leave him at the mercy of extraterrestrial beings. What follows is the account Travis gave to Penthouse Magazine, which, <laughs> along with all the letters and piss, actually had some pretty good journalism here and there. All right. I, I, unfortunate, the, 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 yes, the really good condensed version of his abduction was in Penthouse Magazine. But I do back up this complete account because I have listened to, and I swear to God, I have listened to seven different Travis Walton speeches. I'm talking over... 12 hours wow. of Travis Walton I've listened to over the last week and he hits all these exactly he he has the story down yeah mm -hmm. so okay I back this up now the moment the beam hit Travis he blacked out he didn't even remember hitting the ground for a time he faded in and out of consciousness the only thing he remembered from that period was a light a few feet above and intense pain in his head and hmm. chest and when he woke up fully he was lying on a table and noticed that the room he was in was hot and humid, the air so wet he could hardly breathe. Uh -oh. And loggers thrive in that because their chest hairs can actually, loggers' chest hair can actually bring in moisture like a plant. Huh. <laughs> Makes sense. Then Travis heard movement. As his eyes adjusted, Travis saw that he was in the presence of three alien creatures. Uh -oh. They were a little under five feet tall with large, bald, domed heads. Their eyes were gigantic and surprisingly brown. Huh. Hmm. With no eyelashes and no eyebrows. And when they blinked, the lids slid down and rolled back up again like pull down window shades. Ooh. <laughs> oh, you don't gotta tell me. And their skin was white and marshmallowy. <laughs> that was his words. Those are, that is Travis Walton's words. Marshmallowy? Yeah, marshmallowy. Mmm, take a little bite out of them. <laughs> Their mouths, ears, and noses were tiny, but Travis does admit they may have been normal sized features on a huge head, making them look tiny, like Haley Joel Osment. Yeah, he's got like a full, he's got a, a boy's face on a big fat alcoholic's head. Right. <laughs> he's right. kind of like, um, it's like Paul Giamatti if he had alopecia. <laughs> they're very intense looking. Yeah. The drawings of them, they're very, I mean, obviously very otherworldly. We're going to see a lot of different variations in the idea of Grays. He said that they did look like robots. That's, a, huh. that's another thing he described, that they moved very strangely and they were very, um, 
soft. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You're also describing if she shaved her head, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. <laughs> yes, that tiny little face, and there's so much stuff around. Yeah, she's got a tiny face. Very strange. Yeah, yeah, very strange indeed. Now, Travis, understandably, freaked out once he realized aliens were standing over him, so he lashed out and hit the creatures to his right, who he said was surprisingly light, and fell into the next one, knocking them both over. Mm-hmm. The way it seems like, it's like, have you ever, like, if you ever wanted to look at like a 85 year old woman and know you could just like snap her arms by pulling on her wrists, yeah, like you could just grab an old woman and like push her down real hard and it'd be really easy. It was like that. I don't. No. Yeah, I really don't do that. Yeah, you know, I never thought about that. Beating up an old woman? Not beating up an old woman. How easy it would be to beat up an old woman? Those I'm are six foot seven. I look at you and I think that. <laughs> Even though you're wiry and tough. Yeah, I am stringy. I, I'm like deceptively a, strong. Oh yeah, man, like a piece of jerky that's just been sitting out on a cabinet for weeks. Ah, you're not old trapper jerky. I can't be knocked over. I know. No one's ever knocked you over. So Travis stood up and staggered backwards against the wall near some shelves. He saw a clear tube and figured he could break off the end and use it as a stabbing tool, bar fight style. But when he tried to break it, he found that the tube was unbreakable and was too light to be used as a club. And Travis said as he was smashing the tube into the shelf over and over again, the aliens held up their hands in what sounds like the universal gesture for just be cool, man, calm down. Be cool, be cool, this is, I am Klaxar, this is my friend. I think his name is also Klaxar. We've never exchanged names before. Hi, hello. Why do, we've been working together for six months. We should have had some sort of intro by now. But but listen, I we just need you to cool out, cool out. We're gonna put this tube up your penis. It it will be fine. Trust us. Ask Barney Hill. He loved it. <laughs> Horrified. When Travis refused to cool out, the aliens turned and hurried out the room through a hallway. Hmm. Travis, at a loss for what to do, walked the same way. But as the aliens had turned right down the corridor, Travis. Left. There's also remembering there's a part of the the way that he describes the environment of the UFO, I think, is very important, is that it looks like brush metal gray. It is all gray. It's like he's an entire it looks like aluminum foil, the other side of it. And all there's no seams on the walls. He's in this big triangle shaped room that leads to another weirdly organically shaped tube that he goes back out into the hallway. So it feels like which is another interest because I was reaching Richard Dolan's new book, UFOs for the 20th first century mind and he brought up another idea of that the idea of a craft is also alive that the craft could also possibly be an entity why are you fucking snickering at me yeah because no. that because that was in fucking Battlestar Galactica yeah good for them so somebody yeah, read the know. UFOs for the 21st century mind yeah when did UFOs for the 21st century mind come out Go fuck yourself. I'm looking at this thing don't now. get into a nerd battle over it this is 2014 2014 yes yeah but I'm just saying. Yeah, Battlestar Galactica was 2007. Richard Dolan's UFOs for a 21st Century Mind is a very oh good God. collection Mar- of all Hold modern- that cover up for. Look at, look at, look that. at it. <laughs> look how cool that cover is. It's Richard Dolan, his head cop. What was over- that TV show as a kid? It's Monty Python. Yes. yes, Monty Python. Yeah, it's like the art of Terry Gilliam, the animation of Terry Gilliam. A wonderful yeah. artist. No, but technically, he can just say anything, right? No. <laughs> no. no, I am just, I am just in a, I am just in a snit today. <laughs> I am the angriest I'm, I've ever been. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Travis walked down the hallway until a door opened to his right. He walked in to find a round room with nothing but a metal chair on a single pole sitting in the middle, facing the other direction. Hmm. Travis carefully approached the chair, thinking he might find someone sitting there waiting for him. But he found that as he walked closer and closer, the lights grew dimmer. And the darker it got, the more stars Travis could see all around him, above, below, everywhere, wow. like an all-encompassing planetarium. And when he got to the chair, Travis saw that there was a panel of buttons and a small green screen on the right armrest, while the left only had a lever. Travis looked across the room and saw some rectangular patterns, which he figured to be doors. And he thought that maybe one of the buttons on the chair armrest Mm -hmm. might open the door so he just started pushing him Henry is this how you would react if you were abducted it seems like just a drunk father trying to watch the Super Bowl (laughs) and he can't figure out how to turn the TV on well he is not nearly as prepared as Dwayne so he got there of course he's very scared he's very disoriented he's in a lot of pain he was thrown by the blue beam he was his shoulder hurts he's all fucked up he doesn't want to do so he's scrambling what I imagine I would do is coolly calmly sit 
go through the investigation with the aliens. I would describe, describe to them, honestly, I am as just as, as invested in this phenomenon as you are as workers, as your subject, and I'm willing to meet you 50-50 to really get to the crux of what it is you're discovering. What are you trying to discover? How can I help you? Huh, all right. Well, when nothing happened, when Travis pressed all the buttons, he decided to try the lever. <laughs> Uh-oh. He found that when he pushed the lever, the stars moved while staying in their same astrological position. It sounds to me like Travis stumbled upon some sort of super cool interactive star map. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. That's fucking cool as shit. Yeah, dude. You, you plug that into your PS4, man. <laughs> that's some cool shit. But after a bit, Travis figured he should probably stop screwing around with mysterious buttons and levers, and he left it all alone. But as soon as he stopped, he heard a noise. He turned around and saw a man standing there, just a regular run-of-the-mill white dude. The only thing that set him apart physically were his eyes, mm. which looked slightly larger than normal and were shining bright gold. Ooh. Like Shia LaBeouf. Yes. <laughs> Travis said the guy was about six foot, well-built, and wore a tight blue jumpsuit with a clear bubble helmet. Hmm. Travis started yelling and screaming, but the stranger gave no answer. He just smiled. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he waited for Travis to calm down and took him by the arm to lead him out of the star room. And Travis figured the guy hadn't answered because he couldn't hear on account of the helmet. Uh. So Travis went along hoping for answers down the line should the helmet be removed. You would think that they would have like some kind of device in the helmet that would allow the person to hear yes. maybe like, a, like a sound. Not as prepared as Dwayne. But that was Travis's idea. Not as prepared as Dwayne. And that was Travis, I, his immediate response to the he couldn't hear because of the helmet. But we don't know, but maybe he didn't want to talk. Or maybe he was not in fact a human, but in fact a Nordic and could not speak to him. Mm -hmm. okay. well, they walked together to an airlock, and when they got to the other side, the atmosphere seemed to change. The dank wetness <laughs> was replaced by a cool freshness. And Travis said the... <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it just sounds like trying new deodorant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the dank wetness will be replaced with a cool whatever the, the cool freshness. freshness. <laughs> Travis said the light was bright like sunlight. They walked through what Travis assumed to be a hangar of sorts as he saw three UFOs similar to the one that had taken him parked inside. Once they were through the hangar, the stranger brought Travis through the hallway to another room where two men and a woman were waiting. These three weren't wearing helmets and all had long, dirty blonde hair. The stranger sat Travis down and left the room. Travis tried to ask him where the hell he was and what the hell they were doing, but again, they just smiled and stared. Welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> so glad that you moved here. <laughs> so what kind of race are we talking here? Nordic. With uh, the aliens. Nordics. These are Nordics. Mm -hmm. And what are they all about again? Sex. <laughs> We're going to get into an episode about this at some point where I wanted to do another episode we will do is that we will talk about specifically Nordic abductions. And I got to tell you what, it's pretty fucking saucy. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, they milk you, but they milk you in a good way. Oh, I see. Good milking. Okay. Well, the woman then stood up, took Travis by the arm, and started leading him to another table. Travis started to get a little agitated again, so they pulled something like an oxygen mask over Travis's face, and before he could reach up to pull it off, he was unconscious again. And the next thing he knew, he was standing next to the highway outside Haber, Arizona, watching one of the craft he'd seen in the hangar hovering above him. A light went out as if a hatch was closing, and the UFO shot straight up into the air without a sound. And out of the five days that he'd been missing, Travis claims this was the only chunk of time he remembered. And what he said was that it, it all told when he talked to the, hypnother the hypnotherapist afterwards, it seemed like it's really just he remembers about 20 minutes of that time period. So five days total, though, huh? Yeah, five days he was gone. Yikes. So after Travis returned safe and sound in Snowflake, the battle for the truth began. With APRO and the National Enquirer on one side, and the GSW, and an old fuddy duddy dickhead named Philip Class on the other. Mm. I fucking hate Philip Class. I hate him so much. I hate him. What's God, wrong with Philip so Class? Much. Classic what? wet blanket. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Classic wet blanket. He was smug. He's condescending. He's the guy, he liked to write 
in all caps for emphasis in letters and articles, as if that just made his point stronger. He was a pretty much a professional UFO debunker. He is the one that created the concept of the that UFOs are ball lightning. That, that he it's, it's, his whole thing is ball lightning and plasma flares. Ball lightning. Ball lightning. He was the guy that said if you could prove uh, conclusively that uh, UFOs existed, he would pay you ten thousand oh. dollars. But you had to take him up on the offer. On the offer, uh, and if you took him up on on the offer, then you had to give him a hundred dollars for every year that UFOs did not go discovered. So he's like the world's dumbest Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> he's making money on top of money. That is he, all right. I see what you're saying now. He's yeah. a total prick. Yeah, class is known in the UFO community for suppressing and distorting evidence to fit his own personal agenda, personal attacks, and as we shall see. Decades-long campaigns of harassment towards those who disagree with him. He even purposely sabotaged our man Stanton Friedman oh. in his quest to link American <laughs> UFO cover-ups with those conducted in Canada. Class is the type of guy hardcore skeptics love. A real top-grade asshole. Go fuck yourself, Philip Class. I hope you're listening to this. Oh, wait, you're dead. Good. I'm glad you're <laughs> fucking oh, did he dead. Is yeah. he a goner? He's a goner. Okay. Yeah, he's like those guys on the internet now that like take Carl Sagan way too seriously. Uh, and they yes. start start all their arguments with, "Well, actually, yeah." He's yeah, like yeah. the uh, he's like the proto "well actually" guy. I see. <laughs> okay. Now let's actually hear Philip Class from a televised debate he had with Travis Walton and Mike Rogers on the Larry King Show. The first voice you're going to hear is going to be Mike Rogers, and then Larry Class is going to interrupt him like a. Dickhead. The man has used character assassination, mudslinging, and uh, outright fabrications in an attempt you to cover up the God truth. You are a goddamned liar, Mike here. Rogers, in, and in, I have an caught attempt. you in falsehood after falsehood, no, you have and not, you know sir. it. No. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just, literally just... Honestly... I don't believe in time travel, but that was the closest I've ever felt to being in seventh grade eating family dinner. <laughs> like that... May, I, just, I could just fall asleep. I just want to you pet a dog. a goddamn liar. Because he... Because that the first voice you're hearing was Mike Rogers' voice. And then he comes in. He... He hates UFO so much, it's almost kind of like he was abducted by a UFO a long time ago, and he really fucking liked it, and they saw what a fucking big old slut he was for it, and they decided not to pick him up again. He hates UFOs like Jeff Sessions hates weed. <laughs> ah, I see. Very interesting. But he's just up there just being like, yeah, yeah, you're a goddamn liar saying you won't put that tube up my penis. <laughs> right, because right. Because I... I'm ready to shoot all night long, you tiny brown-eyed little seductors. You little <laughs> uh, fucking sweet, sweet uh, succubuses. Huh. Come, and, come and check my asshole. <laughs> snap in my fucking uh -huh. asshole. Snap, snap. Meanwhile he's, at an, meanwhile, he's at a Minneapolis airport tapping his foot underneath a stall somewhere <laughs> trying to solicit a BJ from hey. some random traveler. Hey, 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 hey. You an alien? I fucking hate you aliens so much. Suck my dick. <laughs> I'm writing legislation to get you out of this bathroom, alien. <laughs> so APRO set up a full medical examination for Travis Walton after the failed attempt with the hypnotherapist in GSW. They found that Travis had a small red spot at the crease of his right elbow, which appeared to be from a hypodermic needle. Mm. The urinalysis also showed a lack of ketones. What does that mean? See, when a person doesn't eat, their body starts to eat itself, oh. breaking down stored fat to keep it going. And while Travis claimed to not remember eating anything, there were no ketones in his urine, implying that he had been well fed for the last five days. Yes. Interesting. You know, when I lost 180 pounds, that was actually the visual that really helped me. Was My it? body eating itself. I thought about little <laughs> like little like Pac Man's eating all the fat. That's really scary. I don't know. Yeah. I thought it was kind of cool that that uh, helped because. So it, you thought that you, you just had that your body was like filled with langoliers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, it was kind of a cool thing. Now, before you say that Travis might have been fed intravenously through the needle hole by the aliens, the spot was not on a large artery. Which which is how one is fed in such a manner. Oh. This means that either Travis was being fed another way by the aliens, uh -oh. or was just hanging out watching TV for five days. Hmm. But others also claim that the ketone test was, quote-unquote, inconclusive. Okay. 
What's harder to explain, though, was the lack of bruises on Travis's body. If things happened the way the logger said it happened, then Travis should have had a huge bruise on his right shoulder from being thrown 10 feet by an energy beam. But when he was examined, no bruises were found. Now, this could actually somewhat be explained by a recent revelation Travis had about his abduction. He believes that the aliens did not abduct him for testing or sperm harvesting or any of the other typical reasons aliens have. Travis believes that they took him in because they had accidentally injured him with their propulsion system. Oh. Now, this is actually, in my, in my estimation, this is pretty legit. Travis had some sort of psychic communication with the aliens. This is how they work, right? And so I think this thing that you're about to break down, which is, which is what Travis laid out, I think it's actually pretty close to the truth of what could have happened. Yeah. And well, in no way did I laugh when Henry said that. I'm getting so much. I'm getting so good. <laughs> you, you're getting I want, no, I want this, to be with you, Mar Henry. I'm supporting you. Yeah, you want to believe. You I, want to believe. I want to believe that Henry. I want Henry to be happy. That's Thank you. <laughs> now, in this scenario, the aliens were parked out in the middle of nowhere, minding their own business, when some yokel walks up and starts uh. gawking. Travis. Hey, look. Hey. Hey, look. <laughs> ha, ha. I want to go. Can you get my brother Dwayne? Can we go get my brother I wonder what the Dwayne? aliens are thinking when they just see this guy. <laughs> well, what they think is that... He's been recently emptied. <laughs> well, he's going to be no good to us. He has recently emptied. Well, what they're thinking is that they need to get the hell out of there. So they right. turn on their engine and leave, but the idiot outside ends up walking into the spaceship equivalent of a jet turbine. Uh. And so they feel bad because they accident almost killed this guy. Because imagine, right, UFO's engine, the way they say, are gravitational. They create a hole in gravity in front of them and it pulls them forward, which requires gigantic spinning electromagnets inside of it, right? It's some weird kind of thing. So when it takes off, it builds this huge field. And when he pops into it and he gets too close, he like pops the bubble. And it's like when you touch like the, the big like electro balls, it's just like, Bleh! it's just you you pop it and then you get the energy in you okay yeah i'm not a scientist <laughs> i am just an investigator yeah, i am more uh, of a person yeah, I, I remember that paper reading that scientific paper get the energy into you ah uh, yes i loved that one that one got me a d in high school i am i can already see what's the what's the movie with jake gyllenhaal where he ends up setting up all the crime scenes so he can take nightcrawler the, nightcrawler yeah henry is going to be the mufon version of nightcrawler yes <laughs> Make the news. It's gonna, get, it's gonna get dark and it's gonna get scary. So when Travis gets hurt by the aliens, the aliens feel bad. They bring him onto the ship and they spend four and a half days repairing his broken body. Travis accidentally wakes up while the Greys are doing their job. He freaks out. The Nordics swoop in to clean up the mess and they drop him back close enough to where they picked him up, just about mm. 30 miles away. This is one possible scenario. And if okay. you could just for a second be serious. Both of you. <laughs> and just think about yeah. this. This is a pretty valid explanation. You fucking, I hear the judgment. No, I'm I not. I feel it. It's a good story. Everywhere I go. It's a very good story. So, yeah, no, it makes sense. The aliens abducted a logger, uh -huh. and then they messed it up because he woke up because they didn't do enough anesthesia, which happens it to happens. people. It happens. It happens. And then, and then Gray's... It came and they they cleaned up the mess. The Nordics came the and cleaned Nor up. The oh, mess. of course, yeah. <laughs> and then they just dropped no him off, uh, just you know, just kind of thirty miles outside of town. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's beyond reasonable. Our last sponsor on last podcast on the left today is ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Finding great talent can be tough. Thankfully, with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. Then, their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of employees who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy to use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash L-E-F-T. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash L-E-F-T. One more time, try for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash L-E-F-T. So after the medical examination, APRO set up a polygraph test for Travis. <laughs> this first test was conducted by John McCarthy of the Arizona Polygraph Laboratory. 
Marshall McCarthy is the same breed as Philip Class. Both came into the story as biased non-believers, right. and both are big fans of ad hominem attacks, meaning they attack the person. They don't attack the argument. But what I, don't, I honestly don't understand the character traits in someone. Why even get into the UFO phenomenon if you don't want to like have a good time with it? It's called being a fucking blogger. <laughs> yeah. It's called being someone that does the same shit. It's literally like you hate it so much that you want to be up in it because you're desperate to believe. These are the saddest of all because all they ever wanted to do, they had their hearts broken when they found out Santa Claus wasn't real a long time ago. Sorry, kids. But you went out there, it's like they, they were so disappointed that the Easter Bunny wasn't fucking their mom. I don't know what they thought it was, that now they're like, they're the psychiatrist from the movie The Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. A, what does that say? It's like inside every cynic is a wounded optimist. I say, get over yourself. I never heard that saying before. You like it? I love it. <laughs> I love it. That'll happen. That'll happen. Uh, that's very interesting. My parents never let, let me know that Santa Claus uh, was ever real, but uh, they always told me Santa Claus was fake. But Jesus, very real. <laughs> very real. <laughs> well, during questioning, McCarthy discovered that Travis had smoked weed a few times. And sure, he'd done a little speed and maybe dropped acid a time or two. But for fuck's sake, this is 1975. Yeah, he's a logger. Yeah, he, this is, these aren't exactly rare occurrences. Mm -mm. But that didn't stop Class from bringing it up again and again Ugh. throughout the years. Every single time he talked about this case, he always was like, well, he was a known drug user in the past. Oh, my Have goodness. you ever seen anything like that while on acid or on mushrooms? <laughs> no! Have you ever seen a full apparition once? I've done it dozens of times. I did mushrooms. I wanted to see this kind of shit. I mean, I went at once very intense. I had a very intense trip once where I saw the, like, the I broke away and I saw a weird-ass alien spirit guy that was in the shape of the dude from Big Lebowski, and I saw these 3D planes of information, but I was also closing my eyes and allowing my mind to drift. I didn't just see it. Yeah. I once rode a roller coaster out of hell and uh, space. Really? Yeah. But well, my eyes were closed. Hmm. Yeah. I've never. Well, what uh, Philip Class hypothesizes is the uh, puncture wound was from Travis Walton injecting a mixture of acid and angel dust. Wow. What are you even talking about? I don't even <laughs> know if that's a combo. About? Is that a drug combo? I, I googled it. It wasn't really a drug combo because yeah. it sounds that sounds like that's how you murder your mother. I think yes. I think technically it's called a silver dollar pancake. Uh oh. <laughs> and you can get it in certain parts of Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Not a tree in sight. Well, right after class brought up the occasional drug use, he'd also bring up another youthful indiscretion that Travis had taken part in as a teenager. He and a friend had apparently stolen and forged some payroll checks for a little bit of quick cash. They were 16. They were stupid kids. Again, not great, but not the worst thing in the world either. I don't think that that makes you make up a story about alien abductions. No, absolutely know? not. Maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust the guy if he was running a car dealership, perhaps, <laughs> uh, or being a plastic surgeon. But, but being a logger... That is all you need to be a logger, is a little he's bit of a, a risk. Logger. Yeah, he's a logger. He's a little bit of a risk taker. He loves old cars and karate. He understands what he has to do. He understands what, what he's needed. He just needs to be his own moral compass. Absolutely. Ben, between the ages of 12 and 18, how many felonies did you commit? None. I never got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> we, I will say we had a lot of cigarettes in my high school. <laughs> and I will also say we did not pay for a lot of cigarettes. <laughs> And a lot of beer. So after discovering the weed and the theft, McCarthy decided to turn the screws on Travis a little. He asked Travis if he had, quote-unquote, colluded with anyone else to cook up this whole story. And when Travis had to admit he didn't know what the word colluded meant, mm. McCarthy aggressively said that colluding meant conspiring with others, just had Travis had colluded to forge payroll checks. They're getting Robert Mueller on the case. This is going to be huge. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah, it isn't a UFO case until somebody mentions the word colluded. Collusion. Collusion, Collusion is big, like what Eisenhower did. And at the end of it all, McCarthy Carthy concluded that Travis was lying, saying that Travis had periodically tried to hold his breath in an effort to, quote-unquote, beat the machine. 
And according to APRO, Travis's agitated state from being abducted by a UFO, along with the aggressive nature of McCarthy's questioning, rendered the test meaningless. Well, that was all the thing. The, McCarthy included his judgments in the cover letter of the test results, which is what a polygraph tester is not supposed to do. You're supposed to just kind of be like super neutral and be like, okay, here you go. These are, this is, these are my recordings, and someone else is supposed to analyze them, and he did this whole, like, smearing him. He hated UFOs. I see. He put some bias in it, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the results, which were paid for by the National Enquirer, were not released. And many debunkers claim that this suppression is direct evidence that Travis and the other six men were lying all along. This is despite them passing every polygraph test they took from then on up till present day. But whether any of these tests mean anything at all depends on how much credence you give polygraph tests. None! None. Polygraph, I mean, they, they have been, they, they're no longer used in a court of law. Can you imagine how many people are currently imprisoned who are innocent because of a polygraph test? But that's for a different show. It and is. We will talk about that. It is. So after Travis took a second polygraph test and passed, he and Coral Lorenzen. What was that? Coral Lorenzen. So Coral do you have to be drunk? Do you have to be drunk to say the name, or can you try to do it so? Yes. Oh, Coral, Coral Lorenzen. I gotta say, you're you're the prettiest woman I've ever met. Is named after a C structure. <laughs> Coral Lorenzen. She was the co-founder of APRO with her husband. Okay. They decided that it was time to start doing interviews. Travis's first interview was with KOOL, Cool TV, on the show Face the State, hosted by Jim Ryerson and Chuck Diamond. Face the State also sounds like a death penalty show, <laughs> where you just light up and it you're does. just... <laughs> it does. There's a lot of death Welcome penalty. Welcome to Face something. the yeah, State. Super Today, yeah. it's, a, it's like a version of the movie Running Man. Yeah. Face yeah. the State. Now, I've read the transcript of the interview, and the interesting thing about Travis's account is, as Henry said, 40 years later... It has remained the same from this very first interview. It is very solid. It is a very solid story. He repeats it again and again. They, it is, it's on the money every time. He doesn't embellish anything. It's really, because that's kind of the things. Like, Fire in the Sky kind of blew this up into something that it definitely was not. Like, it was, the abduction is way more what we talked about at the beginning. It's dumb and weird, but idiosyncratic. It's like a thing where obviously... He has very specific memories. Yeah, I mean, uh, UFO abductions don't follow pacing and plot points. Mm. You know, they have to be stylized quite a bit. And Fire in the Sky, the alien abduction scenes, that's why you watch the movie, because the alien mm. abduction scene at the end is amazing. It's one of the coolest alien abduction scenes ever filmed. Yes, mm -hmm. but but also at the same time, remember, which is my, my full, it, it happens almost in a dreamlike state. I do again believe that we create... 50% of the phenomenon. There's like, we're meeting these entities halfway with creating the, 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 the way that we play, the way that they are sort of like allowed to come into the world and interact with well, us. Well, you know, none of the seven men have. I did not laugh again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Well, none of the seven men have ever changed the story or altered it in hmm. any way since they came out of the woods that night. This is what Tracy Torme, writer of the Fire in the Sky screenplay, had to say about the group. Because she interviewed all of these guys. Mm -hmm. Outside of Rogers and Walton, the other guys were extremely unimaginative, semi-literate, yet their stories hung together perfectly in minute detail more than ten years later, even when I tried to trick them by saying things that were a little off. Hmm. But that did not stop the debunkers, specifically Philip Class. Well, really, her argument was his. that they're... Oh, his yeah, argument. Tracy Torme, Tracy Torme That's is a man. man. And the son of Mel Torme. No kidding. No, Velvet Fog. I love Mel Torme. <laughs> yeah, also wrote a bunch of Star Trek Next Generation episodes, a lot of Battlestar Galactica episodes. No kidding. Yeah. Huh. Tracy Torme made a force in science fiction. So, but the only... The, one of the main arguments is they're too dumb to lie. Yes. yes. Some of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that didn't stop the debunker, specifically Philip Class. His campaign against Travis Walton began in an article he wrote in the newsletter for the National Investigators Committee on Aerial Phenomena, a.k.a. NICAP. He actually laid out a pretty good argument, even though almost half of it was written in all caps like he was screaming at the reader. Mm. But some readers didn't agree with Class, and this will give you an idea of how these people speak to each other. I would like to see a book written in all italics, just so I know <laughs> the author's a little insecure. Ooh. <laughs> now, this reader, named Donald L. Klein, wrote a rebuttal to the newsletter issuing a three-page point-by-point takedown of Class's assertions. Now, this is how he ended the letter 
And this is 100% real. I submit. Philip J. Class disproves himself every time he publishes the results of one of his quote-unquote investigations. It has been said before by one more illustrious than I, and it shall no doubt be said again as long as Class continues to publish. Class dismissed. P.S. I do not wish to be associated with an organization so indifferent to an in-depth investigation and fair reporting. Please consider my resignation as a member of NICAP as being effective immediately. I love it. I can see the kids going and down the alligator run as this guy sits sipping a pina colada in an inflatable <laughs> pool, just wearing fun short shorts that have like Garfield on them. I cannot wait to send my strongly worded letters with my yes. letterhead. I'm going to have a full letterhead. I'm going to send typewritten letters denouncing people. It must be written within with at least seven inches of water. You have to be somewhat submerged in order to really write these. No, that's just one tiny example of the infighting between these people. MUFON, that's the Mutual UFO Network, actually compiled a 375 page dossier collecting dozens upon dozens of documents related to the Travis Walton case. It is thick. We made it through like maybe I made it through 95 pages. I think I read of it. I read a lot of and it. And it's a lot. I read quite a bit of it. Uh, but there were the parts that I started skipping over. Uh, some of the barbs thrown between GSW and APRO, like those were mm. kind of fun. But the vast majority of the letters that I s skimmed are between Class and Mike Rogers, mm. the best friend who was driving the truck that night and kind of became the spokesperson after Dwayne kind of lost interest a little bit. Hmm. See, Mike was acting as the point man for all this, for what came to be known as, quote, the nine test subjects, which was the name the seven dudes and a couple of people from APRO gave themselves. For years, and I mean Years, class berated these guys, writing letters, making phone calls, tracking them down. Even after they moved and did not leave forwarding addresses, he came to their homes, all trying to get them to recant their story. And this is really this is the telling right here. This this next bit about offering Steve Pierce, the youngest witness, who also took much umbrage with the fact that Travis Walton always described him as crying when the police came. Yeah, hmm. he was sixteen. He was young. Sure he was scared. It's emotional. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this guy, uh, class, he offered Stephen Pierce $10,000 to go back on what he said. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. Wow. He was going to do it. He didn't do it. He was going to do it, and then he didn't do it because mm. he has honor. Well, you he's a logger. He's a logger. He's got a fucking backbone. He knows the only thing he can trust is fellow loggers and trees. And if you break that trust between another logger, you can't go back. Squirrels will attack you if you know that you've been <laughs> ousted by a logger. Because actually, that is what Mike Rogers, what Mike actually said to him was that, if you know if you do this, you're out. Uh-oh. Like, he used the, he said the terms, you're out, which is sad. We have here a piece of an interview from Stephen Pierce. This is 2015. Stephen Pierce never came out and spoke out loud about this. Travis Walton and Mike Rogers were doing this on their own. The other buddies kind of split, and they were like, well, we don't want to be involved with all of the UFO bullshit and UFO conference stuff. But he came out and finally did an interview in 2015. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't just harassment from, client that, from class that did these guys in. Check out this interview. I didn't leave Arizona because of Philip Class. You know, I didn't leave Texas because of Philip Glass. I left those places for, you know, I left Arizona because I was tired of being harassed by everybody. I can't sleep at night. I stress all the time. I'm scared of the woods. I cannot sleep in the woods by myself. Um, in my family, they, they, do, they do not believe me. That's what really hurts the most. My ex-wife used to tell me not to tell nobody because they thought I was nuts. You know, you can't, go, don't be going to somebody's house and telling them the story because it's embarrassing. They think you're nuts, you know. I don't even believe she really believed the story. Uh, but the why was he sleeping in the woods alone? Because he's camping. Of course you can't sleep. It's not a reasonable thing for a logger to do. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah. in the Or any bit. sort of woodsy man. Sleeping in the woods alone? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> he looks trustworthy. I will say he has a trustworthy face. What does this guy get out of 
after all these years coming back and talking about this shit. They're not making money. I think that's a big thing that they all say that like, oh, these guys make so much money. You know, like they get all these books. It's like you, a book deals. It's like the advance is not that much money. The, mo- the money goes away fast. Then you have like, especially because the book is, it's not like communion, right? The book is out of print. I had to pay $45 to get the Walton experience. Like that is not, and that money's not going to him. It's going to use bookstores. The the movie only made so much money. The money goes. This guy is just kind of sad. It yeah. was very sad. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And this guy wasn't the only one. Uh, another one of the guys, Ken Peterson, he was so scarred by the event in the aftermath, mm. he actually left the Mormon church. He gave up his religion and moved to Mexico. Mm-hmm. And these guys weren't the only ones involved. Over the years, they brought in a whole new cast of characters. And one of them was this guy named Cleve Baxter. Uh-oh. who was supposed to administer, <laughs> administer a new polygraph test at class's request. Cleve is an underappreciated name. I never heard the name Cleve <laughs> before, but I do kind of like it. Yeah. But Cleve was Mike's guy, uh-huh. and class rejected him because he found out Cleve claimed that his polygraph test proved that plants have feelings and can tell when they're loved. They can. <laughs> and you know, when when you mow the grass, that's actually that smell. It's not good. It's them crying. Crying. Yes. So you shouldn't mow your grass. You have to mow your grass. I understand, but it is it, grass is feeling that, too. You do Some have to mow your grass. sacrifices must be made. Uh-huh. The idea, bre- eggs have to be cracked. You make omelets. Omelets have to be eaten by people getting breakfast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Cleve is telling the guy, these guys they got to take a new polygraph test. Mike comes back. Hey, I got Cleve. Class says, this guy's no good. And Mike says, fuck you. We're not using anybody else. And so mm. class says, never mind. And nothing was ever resolved between these guys. Oh. And Fucking in uh, class, he was still writing about this story 20 years later. They I, need each other, though, and yes. you get the feeling they really should just be friends. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but yes. it, it, no, the fucking class has no true friends. I see. Yeah, yeah. class is like what? He's Mr. Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, they Mr. don't have Wilson. They don't have friends. They just have ex-wives. Oh, and children playing around the yard that are mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say is, of all, of every so most of the time you read about, all of these guys have ex-wives. No, they're all alone, except for Travis Walton. Travis Walton still with his wife Dana, and they were very madly in love. As a matter of fact, they bumped up from girlfriend to wife after the event. Really? Yeah. And uh, his Travis Walton married Mike Rogers' sister. Bam! Look at yeah. that. And and that's one of the things that's like super sad about uh, Fire in the Sky. The epilogue to the movie. You know, every time they do a true story, there's always an epilogue. Yeah. The only thing they say about Mike Rogers is like he got divorced. That's and it, then huh? they said, yes. Travis Walton got married. Look at that. And that's it. <laughs> well, at least it wasn't the same woman involved in both uh, scenarios. Especially since it was one of their sisters. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good. Hell yeah. <laughs> that's, called, that's called a logger. A logger's right. A uh, logger has the right to fuck your sister, <laughs> but you have to marry them. I don't know if that's true, but. No, really, I will give class a little bit of credit for bringing up a couple of questions concerning the story. Now, first of all, as you said before, Dwayne Walton was a UFO buff, and just before the abduction, ABC aired a TV movie called The UFO Incident, which told the story of Betty and Barney Hill, oh. which our listeners are already familiar with. Of course. And coincidentally, if you'll remember, Betty and Barney Hill were also accused of taking their story from a TV show. In their case, it was an episode of The Outer Limits. Hmm. It's just, people just watch sci-fi, goddammit. <laughs> they just watch sci-fi. And also, perhaps, quote-unquote, coincidentally, the aliens described by Travis Walton sounded suspiciously similar to how the aliens were portrayed in the Betty and Barney movie. Hmm. Even the way he described how the aliens blinked seemed to be taken straight from the program. Well, now I think I'm on the side of class. <laughs> That's it? That's you all it takes for you? Is, I heard they watched a movie it? about that's Betty it? and Barney Hill, and the aliens were the exact same. But I don't know if they actually... I don't think that they showed the, the aliens in the movie. I believe they just described them. So, yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> all right. I'm investigating. <laughs> Not yet. You I'm haven't had your... You don't have your lanyard yet, so... Well, God the, damn it! The thing is about class that I really don't agree with is the, his... A motive, the motivation that he says that all these guys had just doesn't add up. It's not, bi- it's not a big enough motivation to go through all this trouble. Class's big sticking point is log related. <laughs> of course, they're loggers. Now, Class's contention was that the entire story was concocted so Mike Rogers could weasel out of the logging contract he and his men were working on during the abduction. That was the whole motivation. 
they're weaseling out of contracts. Beginning to end. Yeah, it's, but they were basically saying but he would not have gotten the money anyway. It's not that much money. It was this weird-ass thing about because it was so, he would have to pay a penalty fee for not finishing a job on time, which makes no sense because they wanted to say it was an act of God that this, this UFO showed up and they would play off this whole insurance scam, which is so complicated. I did hear this Travis Walton guy forged some checks when he was 16, <laughs> and I did also hear he was an intravenous drug user. <laughs> I want to clothesline you. <laughs> That's what I heard. Now, really, there are four possibilities here. One, all this happened as a physical event, more or less how the guys say it did. Two, all this happened as a psychic or hallucinatory event, more or less how the men perceived it to be. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> Three, it was a total hoax. Uh-huh. Or four... It was a partial hoax that only a couple of them were in on. The partial hoax theory says that Mike Rogers and Travis Walton ordered a fake UFO from the back of a comic book and put on an expert-level light show with stunts just to avoid a penalty fee for extending their deadline. Ooh, I want number four to be real. Yeah, it would be. Honestly, it's the cutest one. Yeah, it's the best Because movie. it shows that they just wanted to perform. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, it's the cute. It's definitely... But I don't know. No. And you know what? As it is with every single one of these stories, we'll never know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We'll, we'll never know. I know. I tell you what I do know. What do you know? I know. What do you what know? Do you know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I just know. <laughs> I just know. That's the story. That is the Travis Walton experience. That is the fire in the sky. Yes, and my goodness, now I'm reminded I have to go rewatch that movie. That movie horrified me when I was a kid. It get it has a bit of a slow start. Oh uh, yeah, but the acting is it's like every character actor you like from the 90s is somehow in that movie. Yep. It's great. everyone from the TV show Wings. Yes. <laughs> yes, I will honestly do think that someone from Wings is on it. Henry Thomas from E.T., which is actually what uh, a part of the reason why I was named Henry Thomas, except for the fact that I'm a junior. But my mom was always uh, loved Henry Thomas, the actor. Yep. Huh. Yeah, Henry Thomas from E.T. is in it. Uh, D.B. Cooper's in it. Very no, cool. No, D.B. Sweeney. Excuse D. B. me. D.B. Yeah, Cooper, Cooper was... D.B. Cooper is a d different kind of that's person. That's a different person. That's another mystery that we should get into <laughs> at some another, point. That's another, that's another big that mystery. That is. Yeah. Uh, Henry, uh, so that's it. So that's the Fire in the Sky story. Unbelievable. Very educational. Very fun. Yeah. Um, Henry, I wanted to ask yeah. your mother. We've all learned a lot. How, how excited is your mom for the new show called Young Sheldon, uh, the spinoff from the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> oh, my God. My mom must be just so excited. Be like, and to think, to think what I looked at him, she'd be like, well, I can't even believe he was ever a child. He has seemed such a little, little grown-up all the time. <laughs> I'm just, I can't wait to see his adventures. How did he get like this? And what? what oh, my God. It's, I'm so curious. Henry Thomas, your pick. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love that your mother slowly becomes David Berkowitz. Yes. Well, we've got a lot of cool announcements. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we have here. so much to talk about. First of all, we uh, have a new mailing address. Uh-oh. Finally set it up today. If you would like to send us anything through the mail, send it to the last podcast on the left, P.O. Box 1870, Long Island City, New York, 11101. And we'll go and pick it up. We'll and pick, we'll it, pick up. it up. Yeah, we'll, we'll pick it up. Yeah, we'll find. We've been without getting our uh, well, uh, apologies to everybody who uh, got the stuff they sent to us returned. Uh, but you can send it out to us now, uh, and we can get it. And we uh, can't wait to see uh, all the wonderful gifts. You guys are the fucking best. All the awesome things you guys yep. make us. That's part of my. That's one of my favorite things about this show is just to see the creativity of our listeners. I love it. Fucking great. I cannot wait to get the knives. That that dude with yes. the dead, the, the, dude, the dude with the dead man's eyes mm -hmm. in Nashville. Yeah, can't wait to dude get his knives. Yeah, I want his. I want his knives. Awesome. And also, we are proud to announce. Yeah, the last podcast network dot com. Woo! It's official, ladies Woo! and gentlemen. Yeah, uh, it is the last podcast network dot com. You can go watch all the shows that you've loved uh, from the past. Listen. Or uh, yes, listen or watch. <laughs> stare at your TV. Or stare, stare at the sound stare waves. At the, uh, yeah, stare at the sound waves and watch it as well. Uh, but listen to all the shows that you've uh, come to know us for here on the now Last Podcast Network. Yep, we've got all the same shows that we always have. Uh, but yeah, we're just starting on something new. We've got a lot of new shows coming up uh, in uh, the next few weeks. Uh, we've got a new show from uh, Roundtable Favorites, Reed Failer and Andrew Short. We've got a Spanish language Latin American horror Ooh. podcast called Called Escuela Sangre. Yes, uh, and if you speak, it's gonna be sweet. If you say, I have no idea what they're saying, but yeah. you know, if you like, if you speak Spanish, 
It's there. I'm going to listen to it just so when I go to Mexico, everyone knows to be terrified of me because the only <laughs> stories I'll have are ones about murder. Yeah, this has been a very big effort for us. This is a, this is what we've been working on for the last a couple months. We're shifting every everything over to Last Podcast Network. We got a new website, Last Pod, Last Podcast Network dot com. I think it's going to be fun for all your sundries. Yeah, that's it. And we were number four on comedy on iTunes. So go to iTunes. Let's get to number one. We've gotten to number two, but you know these huge corporations come in and they they basically buy it. Yeah. Yes. So let's get to number one everyone thank you all so much for your support and last podcast yeah. uh network abling its top app for everything political round table of gentlemen feels like you're having some beers with your friends uh wizard and the bruiser if you want to listen to holden and a lot of people do uh <laughs> page seven sex and other human activities movie sign yeah. with the mads yep um let's see and we got a couple of other shows that we're working on and developing that we're really excited to talk about in the future hell yeah man we got some real cool. We got some real cool shit in development. I do a big ass plug on uh, Dumb People Town for Feral Audio. I'm on the, that episode this week. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, follow us on Twitter. I'm at Henry Loves You at Marcus Parks at Ben Kissel. Follow us on Instagram at Doctor Fantasty at Marcus Parks and Ben Kissel the number one. And follow us all on all the bullshits at LP on the left. And we are going to be in South Carolina, or North, North Carolina. Carolina. We're coming to Carboro at Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Durham. That's it. It's sold out. We'll uh, be there next week. Yeah, we'll be there next week. So, uh, yeah, it's a sold-out show. So if you got your tickets, uh, fucking thank you for coming. Be sure on the day of, if you didn't get your tickets, a lot of times some people can't make the show. Uh, yep. And they sell tickets, and we usually retweet those people. So be sure to follow us on Twitter, at LP on the left, to see if you can grab some. That's it. Is it true in the airport of North Carolina that they just hand you cigarettes? <laughs> I think that is true, yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a large smoking lounge in the Raleigh airport. Or maybe it's Durham, but I think it's Raleigh. Uh, we're also going to be is. coming to uh, back to Toronto on September 22nd for the just for the JFL oh, yeah. 42 Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, be sure and get tickets to that. Uh, and we're coming to Pittsburgh, Los Angeles, and Omaha. Uh, and we We've got another show that we hope to announce soon, but That's you're going to have to wait on that until everything's all wrapped up in a tight little bow. That's it. But our, also, know that our Halloween show uh, is about to sell out. We're going to have a fuck ton of special guests at this show. I already got a couple of couple confirmations that I'm really excited about. It's going to be it's gonna be a really fun night to remember. And yeah, someone I saw someone posted a thing about costumes. App, you have to wear costumes. It's fucking Halloween. Yeah. Whatever you want to. If you don't, I don't like to wear costumes. So my, God gave me a costume when he made me six foot seven. I'm gonna dress very nice. I'm going to dress, go. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wear a suit. It's gonna be yep. all black. I'm going full fancy. Yeah, I'm going all black. It's a gala. That's it. And people of Brooklyn vote in September 12th, the primary. We gotta beat these Republicans. Yeah. That's what we gotta do. Um, so email me. You can find me on Twitter with all that stuff. Um, all right, everyone. Hail yourselves. Hail Satan. Hail Gein. Hail me. And hey, remember, watch the skies. You never know what you're gonna see. The, the stars. <laughs> Don't do it during an eclipse. <laughs> Magustulations, everyone.